I wanted to talk today about invasive plant ID and control. Um, I'm going to focus less on the ID because most of the ones that I wanted to to highlight where you're probably pretty familiar with. So instead I'll talk about kind of in general why we control things, that the, the thoughts behind it, and then kind of different control techniques and um, specific recommendations for each of the species. Alrighty. So I do like to start any talk that I give about invasive species just with the definition of what an invasive is, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. When I'm talking about an invasive, I'm talking about a species that is not native to that ecosystem. It was naturally found somewhere else. It has been introduced. Uh, that species then has escaped and naturalized and formed free living populations. Uh, and then those free living populations do some kind of negative impact, some kind of damage. It could be economic damage, environmental damage, ecological damage. There's something as a result of them being there that is negative. And there's uh, invasive species kind of in all taxa uh, in Illinois, whether they're plant pathogens, animal pathogens, invertebrates, uh, vertebrates like feral hogs or, or Asian carp, and then plants as well. So there's a bunch of different ones. I'm kind of a plant guy, so I am gonna focus my talk just on plants, um, but just know that there's a bunch of different invasive species that, that we deal with here in, in this state. Um, and when you're talking about plants, really any habitat you're in, whether it's aquatic systems, prairie systems, urban systems, forest, um, you're going to have to deal with invasive species. Anybody that um, at all handles natural resources, plants, anything like that, um, part of their job, if they're managing those resources, is going to be dealing with invasive species one way or the other. And we're finding that there's a lot of impacts to having these invasives on the landscape. Uh, just one example is probably one of the worst invasives we have out uh, bush honeysuckle. Um, there's some interesting research out there showing that an infestation of bush honeysuckle, which is an understory plant, a shrub, um, it's such a good competitor for water, for nutrients, uh, that it can reduce the growth rate of your overstory trees by 50% or more sometimes, and at the same time completely restrict tree seedling establishment. So there's some big consequences to having these uh, invaders on the landscape. Um, you add to that uh, another one example, garlic mustard. Uh, it's really unpalatable, so not a lot of our wildlife eat it. Um, and as it moves in and, and it starts replacing our native understory, you start drastically changing the habitat quality, the forage quality for wildlife for that forest. And it goes from an area that may sustain quite a number of species of, of animals to one that's largely depauperative food sources for animals that feed in the understory. So it, it does really drastically change what, uh, how animals can and can't use uh, the, the natural landscape. Uh, and then others can just change how we use the natural landscape. And, and this is autumn olive, and you can say the same thing for buckthorn, uh, for multiflora rose, for honeysuckle, um, that they can form such dense thickets in our understory of our forest or in other areas uh, that you just can't use the area. You can't walk through the area. You, um, it just restricts your access. And so if this is a, a natural land, a public land, a park, um, your um, users, your, your recreationists are not going to get the opportunity to go through there. They're just not going to want to. If it's your own homeland, if it's your own land, um, you're going to have much less options of what you can and can't do in this land with some of these big thick infestations. And unfortunately, uh, this uh, invasive species issue is something kind of of our own doing. Uh, we have a, a varied history uh, when it comes to using invasive species, kind of how we've dealt with invasives. So I like to throw these pictures uh, up in my talks. And these are um, some pictures of old leaflets um, touting the use of these invasive species, highlighting what we should and shouldn't do with them. Um, these are from the 50s and 60s. I like them because on the left there, it's talking about Russian olive and how the good wildlife uses for it. And on the right, uh, it's autumn olive and why we need to plant autumn olive. And I love that the wildlife they highlight on that autumn olive is the exotic uh, ring neck pheasant. Right. So, you know, we started out not realizing the, the problem of these invasive species, not realizing 
uh, the damage they would do. And we brought them over and, and planted them for the positive benefits that we saw in them. And they did have some positive benefits. Um, here's multiflora rose on the left, you know, for it was people were paid to plant it on their lands for living fences and for wildlife cover. Uh, it was actually also used for um, in the road medians as a crash barrier, which is the worst idea I've ever heard. If you crash out of your car and land in a multiflora rose thicket, you just you, you don't want that to happen. Um, or erosion control like on Cerecia lespedeza. So we, we, we brought these in, we used these species, promoted these species, not fully understanding kind of the impacts of these and the damages. So I don't want to blame people in the past because it, every, it was all done with the best of intentions and, and not the understanding needed. Now we do understand of these, these negative ecological impacts and the reasons why we should um, remove certain species that do cause this damage off the landscape. And so just um, since this is a talk for Illinois Arborist Association, I kind of wanted to think a while um, on this and talk about kind of what are um, this interaction of invasive plants and ar arboriculture, um, kind of where is that intersection? And really, you know, arborist um, as a trade, as an industry, uh, many arborists are going to have a lot of responsibilities for the management of parks uh, in natural areas, not only the trees, but just in general for the resource management. Uh, if you're uh, managing, you're an arborist working with um, private citizens, a lot of times you'll be taking care of trees and other vegetation and fence rows and woodlots, um, kind of off areas in the backs of, of residential areas. Um, you're also going to be planting or influencing the choices people make in terms of what they plant or trees and woody shrubs um, and avoiding invasives is a big role there as well as um, some of these invasive species have direct impact to the trees that our arborist will be taking care of and then again back to the planting choices uh, some species are a direct conduit for further invasion either spreading that species around or actually facilitating other invasives so I think there's actually a really important role for arborists when dealing with uh, invasive plants. And so just some examples of that. Here's Japanese stiltgrass invading a campground. Um, so this is an area that an arborist may be, um, may be used to treat the trees, but recognizing the invasives in the understory, you can have a role to play. Um, different invasives kind of all at one time in a park setting. And so that impacts users' experiences. And then again, some of these can just overwhelm trees and be direct threats to the health of our trees. Oriental bittersweet is a classic example of that. It's called the kudzu of the north, right? Just for its ability to grow over top of trees and, and girdle them, kill them, shade them out. And so understanding these species and knowing their potential can help you protect trees um, as you go along. And then just those species that um, are those conduits to further invasion, right? Planting choices, using which species to, to plant, knowing which species to plant. Um, collery pear, Bradford pear, the flowering pear groups uh, as a whole were planted widely throughout um, the whole eastern U.S. Uh, and now they're one of the fastest spreading invasive species we have. And so planting choices and understanding that this is one that you want to avoid moving forward bringing that information to uh, landowners that you work with are, is important. Uh, and then a species that you uh, will hear more about if I think if you attend tomorrow's meeting, um, spotted lanternfly, which is one of our biggest invasive insect threats that we worry about getting into Illinois. Um, its life cycle is tied fairly heavily uh, to tree of heaven. And so finding populations of tree of heaven um, in an area could increase the risk for spotted lanternfly. So that's again, that's that conduit for further uh, invasive species. So kind of understanding how the intersection of arboriculture and invasive species, there's a very, very important role that uh, us as arborists that we need to play in this, this issue. Um, arborist, you know, really in a lot of ways, because you're in these urban areas, you're in areas where the pathway of introduction for new invasive species is kind of highest, highest risk. I, I see um, arborists really serving as some of those first detectors 
finding new invasive species when they first show up, whether it's uh, invasive insects like Asian longhorn beetle or spotted lanternfly, or just new bad acting ornamentals. So plants that are used out on the landscape that you're seeing spread, you're seeing them um, kind of escape from plantings and in, going into more natural areas and kind of finding those and being those eyes to report those and then influencing uh, planting choices uh, is a really important role for arborist. And then uh, educating the public. You're often the tree experts that most landowners talk to um, from day to day. So educating the public, educating the clients of the importance of invasive species management, the importance of planting choices. That is a huge role that arborists play. And then just doing work to protect or enhance biodiversity in this urban residential landscape that so many of us work in. Uh, and that could be through management and control of invasive species, promotion of native diversity, all of that. So these are all roles um, that I think we all play when dealing with invasive species um, in our role as arborist. Now, not all invasives are equal, and I think there's suites of invasives that are more likely to be a problem in this, uh, what I call the wildland urban interface. And that's a common term, people call it WUI for short, if you haven't heard that before. Uh, a WUI, a wildland urban interface, is just what it says. So it's, it's the intersection of natural unmanaged or natural unmanicured landscapes with more intentional manicured landscapes or, or peopled landscapes. And so this intersection of both of these um, is an area where natural resource management is a little more complicated, a little more difficult, and you have some unique, uh, unique uh, challenges there. And so invasive species that, that do well in this wooey, this, er, this interface, typically are ones that are good dispersers. So they can move around, they can spread from intentional plantings uh, they tend to be ones that are promoted by disturbance. And so there's a lot of um, edge habitat in these, these interfaces, these wooey interfaces. You're going to have more highlight environment, more edges, more bare soil, a lot of times high nutrient availability. And so species that do really well in that kind of disturbed habitat are going to be ones that uh, you expect to find at, to a higher degree in the, the wildland urban interface. And um, for obvious reasons, species that really have a history of being used ornamentally are ones that are gonna show up a lot oftentimes in this wooey. So things like that collary pair. So later on in the talk, um, I am gonna highlight seven different species that uh, I think really fit into this uh, wildland urban interface uh, uh, highlight that I wanna highlight. And so they're garlic mustard, starting from the top left and moving right on the top row. We have garlic mustard, uh, our bush honeysuckle species, multiflora rose, our autumn olive, and in the bottom row, it's oriental bittersweet, tree of heaven, and collary pear. There's certainly many other species that fall into this group, and we could have a whole talk just going one species after another. I just didn't think that would be the most interesting of talks. So I'm gonna highlight these kind of big seven here. Um, I could have easily added uh, common buckthorn into this one and I probably should have. Uh, just traditionally the, the summer conference is a little more of a downstate uh, conference. So I wanted to focus on the downstate state species a little more than uh, common buckthorn, which is often a, a Chicago region problem. But again, all of these um, fall into that species that I think are particularly problematic in this wildland urban interface. And so we try to manage these, right? These are the species that we want to control. Um, and a lot of times management, people think management is just eradicating and killing that species, but really you have to look and to be successful in managing species, you have to understand what are your goals and what's your ultimate goal for managing uh, an invasive and really that management is to reduce, prevent, or eliminate that negative impact of those invasives. Um, your goal of getting rid of them uh, is simply uh, there because they're doing something that's negative. There's some negative impact of those species. So everything that you do management-wise should be aimed at trying to negate those impacts, trying to uh, ameliorate those impacts and lessen them. 
And that involves a bunch of things. It could be the traditional controlling established infestations, killing plants. Um, that's a big role. That's a big part of management. But it's also preventing the introduction and the spread of new invasive species. I think that's really important as well because that's often easier and cheaper than trying to control an infestation that's been there for a long time. If you can prevent it from starting at the first, first place, um, you're going to have a lot more success. And then lastly, with management, it's the, the role that people often forget about when they're talking about invasive species management is really promoting those desirable species, promoting species you want to be there in place of those invasives, promoting healthy systems that are full of, of species that um, can resist invasion better than a system that's damaged, um, disturbed, and that's kind of an, an open uh, avenue for invasives to move in. So all three of those aspects kind of fall into management. We'll talk more about uh, the first two than the last one during this talk. So common practices when you come to managing invasives, and we'll talk about these in, in uh, most of these in order here, but um, mapping and survey, knowing what you have, knowing where those invasives are is super important. First critical step to managing invasives, and that involves um, marking invasive species in the field or tracking them online or in a mapping program or some way to kind of re come back to those sites, monitor those sites. Um, and then another important role is spread prevention. Um, cleaning your equipment, sanitizing that, um, removing invasives that are used in ornamental plantings, um, looking for off-site material when it moves in to prevent that from spreading invasives. Again, that's really the, the cheaper way to deal with invasives than waiting until those infestations are, are big and established. And then controlling. So when the infestations do get away, they're big and established, you're looking at controlling invasive species and there's a bunch of ways. We'll get into that into detail at the second half of this talk. But that's mechanical, chemical control means. And then finally, restoration, like we mentioned earlier, uh, promoting the, the desirable species. We're not gonna talk about that as much. But just understanding that uh, dealing with invasives is a, more of a continual thing. If you are the owner on the right side of this picture here, you controlled your uh, bush honeysuckle all the way up to the line, but your neighbor didn't, who's living on the left side of that property line, um, what's going to happen, right? Those species are just going to move right back on. So it's important to kind of realize that it's not a one and done thing. You can't just kill all the invasives and walk away. This is something that needs to be integrated into your annual work, into a site, because um, there's going to be reinvasion in new species. And so just kind of understanding the the um, the kind of long-term goal that you have to have when you're managing invasives on any one site. All righty. Well, let's hop into just some of these different types of management um, practices. Again, mapping and monitoring really important. Um, mapping in the field, I like to, if I find especially small infestations or, or one or two plants, I'm worried about being able to relocate them in the future. I usually keep just in my pocket or in my truck a little roll of flagging and it's usually one particular color. It might be, um, you know, pink or something like that. It doesn't matter, but you kind of have one color to mark invasive species. And if I find a small infestation and I don't have the equipment to control it right there, I'll tie a piece of flagging up there, or put a pin flag in, or put some paint. Usually for me, it's flagging. But anything to help you relocate that, that those plants in the future when you come back and you're ready to control those species. It seems like a simple act, but it is really, I think it's really, really important. There's so many times where I've been walking through the woods or, or doing something, and I find a species, but I don't have the herbicide with me. I don't have the means to control it. And so I, I move on and then I forget about it. I come back and I have a hard time finding it. So simply marking stuff in the field for follow up uh, can really be helpful. Um, you can also mark things on a map, um, capture coordinates with the GPS. There's lots of smartphone apps, there's databases. Again, just so you can come back and find those. Some of the simple free databases out there. Um, iNaturalist is a really good one. You can mark all kinds of native species, organisms, insects, it doesn't matter. Um, but I use it a lot and I know some landowners use it for marking all the invasives on their land. It's kind of a free system. You can come back and check in on those points. Um, 
Another one I use a lot is Avenza Maps. So that uses PDFs, and so you can load them on your phone. They're pretty small, and that way it doesn't take data since it's loaded on your phone um, if you're in areas that has bad reception. And you can put in markers. You can load pictures on that. Uh, you can share those. I use it a lot for other applications, but Avenza Maps is uh, usually it's a free download, and it's very, very handy um, just as a way of capturing geographic data and keeping it on your phone. So I like that a lot. And there's others. Um, people use some apps that are specific to invasive species like the EdMaps app or the Great Lakes app on the left. And other people use um, kind of app program or mapping programs uh, like Onyx or Backcountry Navigator. And then you can you can use those for a bunch of applications. But I know a lot of people use those for um, invasive species control or forestry applications. A bunch of different things, but it is handy to have a map to kind of record what you're doing and where you're doing it. Uh, in terms of spread prevention, you know, you're looking at, again, keeping those things from moving around. And I think it's it's really important. Um, one, there's kind of two aspects of that. One is off-site material, like the picture on the left, which is a pile of fill dirt covered with uh, musk thistle. So understanding where uh, material comes from, whether that's fill dirt or gravel or, or anything, and kind of what might be coming along with that. And the other one is equipment sanitation. And we see the bush hog here on the right uh, with all the trash on top of it. That could be all full of seeds. And so simple steps like um, blowing off your equipment, cleaning your equipment, knocking the mud off or pressure washing it in between jobs can really drastically help prevent um, moving around of some of these invasive species. This is a shot from closer to home here in Southern Illinois a pile of gravel. Uh, I'm standing on a gravel road when I took this picture. That pile of gravel there is covered all on the edge with that Japanese stiltgrass, one of our worst invasives. Uh, it's that stiltgrass is spread by seed. So what's going to happen when they come and get that gravel and spread it on the road? They're just going to be spreading stiltgrass up and down the road, right? So some uh, best management practices when it comes to kind of preventing the spread of these would be cleaning equipment after working in areas that have known invasives. Uh, if you're doing mowing or anything like that, don't mow those areas. If the invasives have ripe seed and are actively dropping their seeds, um, all you're gonna do is pick up those seeds in your mower. Try to do that before uh, seeds are ripe, before the plants flower. And then if you're using offsite material, know where it comes from, look for weedy problems in those and then follow up on those areas where you've used that offsite material for a couple years to look at if new and spe new species come in or are or, or, or invading. Um, if you are somebody that, if you're an arborist or a natural land manager that deals with public areas and public trailheads and things like that, I'd highly recommend considering, um, you know, installing some of these boot brush stations. The idea behind those, it gives a little signage that educates the public and then the public can come in and clean their shoes off, knock the seeds off um, to kind of prevent spreading species around. I think it really, it's beneficial of knocking seeds off and preventing them, but it's probably more beneficial as an educational tool. They're not very expensive, um, so it's definitely, I think, a high, highly recommend kind of incorporating those into your education if you work on public lands with trailheads. Uh, it's also a good good excuse to put little pictures of my kids up on these talks. So they all vary in age, but always it's hard not to take a picture of a little tiny kid brushing their boots off. So that's why I put them all in here. But even us as practitioners, um, recreationists, you know, we get seeds on our animals, seeds stuck to our clothes. So just understanding that you could be a, a ve vector to spread these species around, that's an important thing to consider. Um, if I'm working in an area with a lot of invasives, I'll make sure that my boots, uh, my shoes, my pants are cleaned off before I get out of there, pick any of the burrs off that are seeds, just because I don't want to spread these things around as well. Alrighty, I'll have a few things here and then we'll jump into our first knowledge check-in. Let's get into some generic control recommendations first and just kind of talk about those. Uh, one thing I will say just as a great resource is our, our book that we published almost two years ago now, and we've had a couple reprintings. 
is our management of invasive plants and pests in Illinois. And this was a document that was a combination of the Morton Arboretum and the University of Illinois Extension Forestry Program. It gives control information on 40 some different uh, invasive species in Illinois, as well as good information on some of our invasive pests. Uh, it includes a phenology calendar, which kind of gets at the timing of these invasive species. So you'll know, you know, when they're vulnerable, when you can, when they're visible, when you can control them. Really good information, a free PDF download on our Extension Forestry Facebook or, uh, website. So highly recommend um, checking that out. Another really good resource, um, if you're interested, is the Midwest Invasive Plant Network's control database. You can get to that from MIPN.org. And that one, you just go in there and search for the species that you're interested in, and it'll bring up a ton of information about uh, even case studies about that species, how to control it, what to use. So good, really good resources to kind of get that good information. Um, in general, when you're in, uh, controlling a established uh, population of an invasive plant, Again, it's not a one and done thing. You need to expect at least three to five years of work to eradicate an infestation. And that's assuming that you can control the entire infestation at one time. Um, for common stuff, you can expect reinfestation kind of coming in from nearby. And then again, just highlighting that equipment sanitation cleaning is a must because you don't want to spread these around. Different species are going to have different uh, longevities in the soil. And so some species typically are fleshy fruited ones, um, might have shorter lifespans, you know, they live five years or less in the soil. Um, some of our other species like the Lespedes or Multiflora rose, you're looking at decades of time in the soil. So kind of understanding that, understanding how long the infestation was on the landscape can kind of tell you uh, kind of how long you need to work in there and control them. Uh, don't let this overwhelm you though. I mean, most of the time for most of these, um, the vast majority, 80 plus percent or more of the seeds are gonna germinate in year one after they're produced or year two. Uh, there's, but there's always a chance that some of those seeds can live around, live a long time in the soil. So you just need to plan to come back and monitor and check those sites um, for a period even after the plants are, are all removed. And then uh, lastly, before our check-in here, depending on the species you're dealing with, there's really different principles for managing those. If the invasives you're dealing with mostly are annual or biennials, uh, so that, uh, those as groups of plants are species that really, really only reproduce by seed. They live one or two years, and then they'll produce seed and die after setting their seed. That's the way those plants kind of continue their populations. In those cases, your goal as to managing those species, you don't really care if that species lives or not because it's going to die after it sets seed. Your main goal is to prevent that seed set. You don't want it to produce future seed if you, uh, if you wait too late and it's already producing seed, uh, you're done for that planet, you're past time to control it. So you need to make sure that your timing of your control is done accordingly. You wanna do that before it starts setting seed, typically at the point of flowering or a little bit before, because so that's your main goal. For perennial forbs, so these are ones that live multiple years um, and have an established root system. They produce seed every year. Those um, often, those are the ones that have a longer lived seed bank. Your goal is to prevent that seed set, that's important, but ultimately you're trying to kill that root system trying to get it out of there, kill the root system to stop future seed being produced. And then lastly, if you're dealing with woody plants, these are often long lived plants, so shrubs, vines, uh, but most of them have a short lived seed bank. So their seeds don't live in the soil more than one to three years. Um, they usually sprout back after mowing or cutting them down. So your goal with woody plants, you don't necessarily worry too much about the seed production because it has such a, a short lived seed bank and you're gonna to have to deal with sprouting anyway. Your main goal for those is timing your control at a point in time when the root system is most vulnerable, so you're gonna kill that root system. Sometimes that's in the fall, after those plants have already produced seed. Um, if that's the most vulnerable time to control them, that's when you wanna do that. So again, understanding the biology of the species you wanna control can kind of help you set your plans and find, and realize your goals for controlling them and, and set accordingly. Alrighty, with that, 
we have our first check-in and I wanted to do a cool picture and not an invasive. So I have something you don't see every day is a frozen Cypress Tupelo swamp. So that's the picture you get to look at as we do our first knowledge check-in. And April, I do believe you have a poll we can put up. Alrighty, so please answer. I think we have a couple questions. So answer these if you can, and um, at the end, we'll kind of highlight what's up. So remember, this is the one, which one of these is not included in the definition of an invasive species? Alrighty, so most of you got it right. That's great. Um, so the definition of an invasive species, invasive species does not include that it's toxic to wildlife. That being said, some invasives are toxic to wildlife, but we're talking about not native to the ecosystem, escaped and naturalized, and does some kind of damage. So I'm happy to see everybody got, most people got that right. Um, you wanna put the next one up, April? Yep. All righty, next one, uh, again, it's about the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface. What is a characteristic uh, that of invasive species in the wildland urban interface? All righty, as most people got it, uh, one of the characteristics of invasive plants that are commonly found in the wildland urban interface are that they are promoted by disturbance. A lot of times this uh, wooey sites have a lot of disturbance, a lot of edge habitat, and so species that can take advantage of that habitat tend to do really well in that interface. All righty. And Chris, don't forget, you are having uh, questions coming through your chat, so I don't, just so you know at the end that you've got more. Do, do we want to take a couple questions right now, April, before I jump into the rest? Um, that's up to you. Yes, let's do that. So I put them to your chat, so you should be able to read them. Oh, I should, you, can, you put them in my chat? I did put them, but I can read them off here. Um, I'll read this one. As a city forester, I have issues with the right of way being overgrown with honeysuckle and buckthorn. Citizens like the screens they provide. Do you have a list of native quick growing shrubs I could replace the screen? Uh, that's a great question. There are quite a few of those. I don't have it on hand right now but um, I can certainly share my email and provide that with you. But there are um, a bunch of quick growing shrubs. Some of the ones that come to mind, depending on the site that you are, um, elderberries, uh, rough leaf dogwood, some of the viburnums, all of those can be um, kind of al you know, alternatives to the honeysuckles and the buckthorns that people like for shade. Particularly some of those viburnums, the native viburnums do pretty well in that kind of habitat. Right, and then we have another question. Uh, how long do buckthorn seeds live? Um, that's a good question. I think buckthorn falls into that group and I'd have to look to be sure, um, into that one to three years. Um, their seeds aren't very long lived. They're a fleshy seeded um, uh, species. So I think by and large, they have fairly short um, seed banks. Okay, and that's it for right now. All right, great. Well, I'll move along then. I'll move off from the picture of the cool frozen swamp. Um, and then we'll just get into the kind of different techniques of control techniques. Um, mechanical control is one. And so, you know, that involves everything from hand pulling, mowing, weed whipping, torching. Uh, this works well for some plants, for not others. So for annuals, biennials, shallow rooted perennials, mechanical control works pretty well. Um, just keep in mind that for those, especially if uh, seeds are present, you'd want to bag and remove those plants. Um, that's a classic thing you do with uh, garlic mustard, right? Garlic mustard pool days. And so that's something you can do and it can be useful, um, particularly if you're, if you're managing with volunteers and you don't want to um, use herbicides in those cases. For woody plants, you can get some assistance like these weed wrenches, um, there's several different kinds that are out there that give you a little leverage and help you pull um, plants out of the ground that may be otherwise too hard to do just by your own um, by your own hands. Again, really great tools if you're look if you're managing sites that, that you have volunteers at um, because they're uh, herbicide free. They're pretty hard to can uh, hurt yourself too much with them, 
and they are big and heavy. So my, my saying about those are they're a great tool for somebody else to use. So I, I do like them for volunteer days. And so there's definitely room for mechanical control out there. Um, I'm going to spend more time talking about chemical control because I think there's a little more to say about it. Um, anytime you're using herbicides, make sure to always use your appropriate protective gear. For most of the herbicides, that's eye protection, doesn't have to be goggles. Um, long sleeves, long pants, closed toed shoes, and then chemical proof gloves, so nitrile gloves or something like that. And it's also very important that you read and follow the label information. An herbicide label is the law. That's a legal document that to use that herbicide, you're required to follow. And so that label is going to give you all the information about that, that herbicide in terms of what it is, where you can use it, how to use it, how much to use, what to do afterwards in terms of restricting access to sites. Um, very, very detailed information. Um, and again, you should really read through that label entirely before you use an herbicide, just so you understand how to use it and how to be successful and effective and safe in using it. Uh, in terms of in Illinois, and if you are um, using herbicides, there are some requirements. If you're applying herbicides as part of your job, uh, you're going to require either an applicator license or an operator license in Illinois. And these are three-year licenses now. Uh, so you test and then you get a three-year license and they have to retest it and get a new license. An operator, um, they work under the supervision of an applicator. So there's certain things, they're not necessarily the decision makers in that case, right? They are the applicant, they can apply the herbicides, they can operate the herbicides, um, but they don't necessarily are the ones that kind of make the decision on what to apply and, and where. Um, they, only have to, they only have to take the general standards test. So that's one test and then they have to work directly under an applicator. Uh, on the other uh, side of things is the applicator. So they are the decision maker. So they oversee the treatments, they make decisions on what to apply, and they have to take additional tests in specific categories. So if you're working in um, rights of way, then you there's a test for rights of way. If you're working in a forest, uh, there's a test for forest. If you're working in aquatic systems, if you're working with mosquitoes, there's a bunch of different categories. And so as an applicator, you need to be licensed in each of those categories that you're gonna apply pesticides or herbicides to. And then kind of the third option for Illinois is uh, a volunteer uh, certi certification. So this has been around for eight or nine years now, and um, it's really just an annual one hour training for volunteers. So they're only allowed to apply the kind of lowest uh, danger level herbicides. So that would be the caution level herbicides, the ones that are safest, and they can't mix and can't handle concentrated herbicides and they have to work under the supervision of an applicator that's an employee of the, the area, the agency or the organization that they're, they're volunteering for. It's really nice because they don't have to take a test. Um, they don't have to pay the money for, for certification, but they still have the ability to help out and use herbicides, the safest herbicides in a volunteer role. So it's a really good add on a few years ago um, to our, our rules and, and requirements here. Um, just in terms of herbicides, there's a bunch of different herbicides. I really can't hit them all during this, so I'm going to be more generic here. Um, but kind of the different types of herbicides you work with when you're dealing with invasive plants. Um, there's some non-selective ones like glyphosate, Roundup. It basically works on all category of plants. And then the rest are more um, specific. So broadly specific plants, broadly specific herbicides. Um, there's some that work on all broadleaf plants. Right, so triclopyr, garlon is a good example of that. And then there's some broadleaf specific plants that are selective to individual groups within broadleaf plants. So one example might be transline, which really works on beans and asters. Aminopyrrolid or milestone is another one that has selectivity on certain plants, but really not on others. Um, there's grass specific herbicides that'll really work on grasses and other monocots. Uh, but not hit your broadleaf plants. So that would be like Sethoxidum or Envoy or a few other ones. And so that's really important if you've got an area where you have an invasive grass that's growing in amongst, um, you know, tree seedlings or something like that. 
And then there's pre-emergent herbicides. So those are ones that work only on the growing point of um, germinating seeds. As that radical comes out of the seed, it'll attack that. So plants that are already established, have an established root system, they're not going to impact. They're only going to impact germinating seeds. So that could be a very, has a lot of use for those annuals or biennials. In terms of treatment types, uh, there's several treatment types I want to hit. One, is the, probably the most common one for woody plants would be the cut stump treatment. And so you can use that on any size of a wood, woody plant, regardless of size. Uh, and it's basically cutting down the woody plant, treating that cut surface with a more concentrated systemic herbicide to prevent sprouting. And so there, just to prove that I actually get outside every once in a while, is me cutting down a big bush honeysuckle. And then you come in, the one on the left was treated uh, with that concentrated herbicide, the one on the right wasn't, so it sprouted back, right? Um, when you're using this cut stump treatment, it's important to apply that herbicide to the stump fairly soon, ideally within 10 to 15 minutes. The longer you wait, that plant is reacting to that, um, that damage from the cutting it down and it's actually starting to compartmentalize that damage and shut those cells down uh, at the cut surface fairly quickly. And once it does that, um, it's gonna reduce the amount of herbicide that gets translocated down into the roots. Your goal of killing that or cutting that plant and treating it is to kill those roots. So you want that herbicide into the root system. So the quicker you do that before that plant compartmentalizes its damage, the better that herbicide is going to get down into that root system. Um, if you treat the entire, for small stems less than two inches, you just want to go ahead and treat that entire uh, surf cut surface. I'm usually a little liberal on it where I like the herbicide to run off the edge just a little bit. I don't skimp when it comes to this. Um, for bigger stems, if you're looking at trees or something, um, just the outer one to two inches of that stem, you're basically treating right in that cambial layer of that of that that cut stem. So you can kind of just do that. I like applying an herbicide diet because it really helps in tracking the treatments and reducing kind of missed stumps. Um, this is most effective mid to late fall. Um, even in the summer, it's pretty effective. Basically, you don't want to treat in the spring using this method. It's less effective as those plants are uh, starting to leaf out. You kind of wait till those leaves are fully erupted before you start using this method. You'll get better control. Um, kind of a cousin to cut stump is basil bark. So basil bark treatments, um, you're applying that concentrated herbicide, typically an oil-based herbicide, directly to the bark of that woody plant. And then you're letting that, uh, that that herbicide and that oil with that oil in that oil uh, penetrate through the bark and kind of get translocated that way. Um, it requires a little more herbicide than a cut stump treatment. You're putting more on there, um, but it doesn't require cutting that plant down. So sometimes it's a little faster. You don't have the slash to deal with because everything's standing. Uh, you want to treat right at the ground level up to 12 to 16 inches high. Um, it works really well. Be careful if you have really dog hair thick stands of an invasive. You can put so much herbicide on that you can get some non-target impacts and kill some other things. But I like it. It works pretty well. If you have heavy snow cover in the winter or if you're in a low area that the stems are really covered in silt, both of those limit the effectiveness of it. And then just be prepared. If you use basil bark in the dormant season in winter, those plants will often go ahead and leaf out in the spring and then kind of wilt and die back. So um, uh, it, it may surprise you when that happens. So this is what it looks like. You know, again, ground level up um, using a backpack sprayer really works. Um, the one in the bottom left is a lot of stems. So you're putting a little much herbicide. I would probably switch on that one to do a, a cut stump or something just because a plant of that size, you're putting a lot of herbicide on, on the ground to kill one plant. And then the last of these treatments would be a foliar treatment. And this is what probably most people are familiar with. You're basically spraying the leaves of that plant uh, with the herbicide. And with it, you don't want to spray it so heavily that the, the herbicide is pooling up on, the, on those leaves and then dripping off. You want to spray it so you have kind of a fine covering of, of dots, of herbicide dots on that, uh, those leaves. That's enough. Don't overdo it. Again, using an herbicide dye really helps. And this is a, a typical treatment for non-woody invasive plants, small woody or, or woody, small woody plants. Um, it's kind of a little bit counterintuitive, but if you need a healthy plant to be able to kill it with this method. 
So it needs to be actively growing, healthy, and to be able to take up that herbicide. So that means full foliage, not a lot of leaf loss, not a lot of yellowing in the fall, not in a drought situation, all of these conditions to get optimum uptake of herbicide. One example here would be this uh, picture of bush honeysuckle. Um, it is past it, so it's starting to yellow, it's starting to lose leaves. At this point, uh, foliar application would not be effective on this plant because it's already starting to shut down a little too far. I do like uh, uh, backpack sprayers for this. It works really well. Um, so you can do that. I think those are good tools for having it. In terms of follow-up, if you're spraying herbaceous plants, I'd recommend following up at least once a season um, so you can kind of get anything you've missed. Perennial plants, if you're doing cut stump or something like that, you want to make sure to at least follow up that next growing season because you're going to miss some. If you're somebody that mows things down, uses a bush hog or a forestry mulcher, um, you're going to have to deal with sprouts, plants coming back from those cut surfaces. And if you don't, if you didn't do a cut stump surface, if you just want to let the plants sprout and spray those, um, you have to be careful about treating too early. If just as those plants are starting to erupt those leaves and you have just the first few leaves of that sprout, at that point in time, it's not the correct time to treat that stump. It's, uh, there's not enough leaf area to take up the herbicide to kill that root system. Instead, for large shrubs, you want those sprouts to get up to 24 inches tall or so before you apply that herbicide as a foliar application, you'll get better control. So for example, the one on the right, if you sprayed it, um, there's not enough leaf area there, you're not going to get good uptake into the, the plant and you probably won't kill that root system. The one on the left, you can see those sprouts are kind of bushy and already, you know, 24 inches tall, something like that. You're going to have a better chance and, and higher success rate for controlling the one on the left than the one on the right. All right, so I'll get into the species, those seven species we mentioned uh, earlier and kind of get into their control recommendations. I'll mention a little bit about ID as well, but these are pretty common, so I think we know most of them. Uh, garlic mustard, as we mentioned earlier, it's one of those biennial plants. So the picture on the left is its first year, the picture on the right is its second year. And so this is one that impacts our understory. Uh, it grows under our forest and fence rows and things, a really problematic plant. Um, the picture on the left is still flowering, but just starting to set seed. And the picture on the right is kind of where it's got all those seed on the, seeds on there. Um, smells like garlic, tastes kind of peppery and a little bit like garlic. Um, again, very, very common herbaceous biennial plant throughout all of Illinois. Uh, to control it for large infestations, I like a foliar spray with either glyphosate or triclopyr before it flowers or even after, even as long as it's starting to flower, especially that triclopyr works pretty well. Uh, once it's set seed, uh, you're looking at hand pulling it and bagging it for um, um, that way of just trying to get it out of there. For small infestations, we've had good luck doing uh, propane torches to burn it or hand pulling it or just spot spraying, again, with glyphosate or triclopyr. Uh, we've had really good luck with late fall applications, spraying those little first year plants. That's a good time to control them when everything else is kind of dormant. And then just a, a reminder, clean your shoes. These things reproduce with these little dark black seeds that'll get stuck in your shoes and the mud in your shoes and your boots. So cleaning them off is a good way. Anytime you're working in an area with garlic mustard, take steps to not spread it around. Uh, bush honeysuckle. So that's probably our worst invasive species across uh, Illinois in general. Um, so it has the pretty flowers, the honeysuckle style flowers, um, in the late spring and then gives way to the bright red or, or some species are bright orange um, berries that are tight to the stem. They're opposite, kind of this arching, uh, arching nature to them, really recognizable when you see them. They usually green up a couple weeks earlier than most of our native shrubs and stay green two to three weeks later as well. But can form really heavy infestations, right? I mean, big stands throughout our forest, again, probably our most damaging invasive plant we have in the state. For this one, I really like fall foliar applications. As long as that foliage is adequate and not starting to yellow, applications of glyphosate in the fall work really well with this. 
Uh, cut stunt treatment works really well with about 50% glyphosate, so you mix it 50-50 with water. Um, you'll see a lot of recommendations for triclopyr and using it. We've done some research, we've done some plot work, and I've heard of a lot of other people too. We get very mixed results if you're using triclopyr um, to control bush honeysuckle, so much so that I'm actually recommending not using that as an herbicide, but for the time being, sticking with glyphosate is the primary one. Um, hand pulling it or using those weed wrenches work really well for this one, even on bigger plants because it has a fairly shallow root system. And then prescribed fire, if you're in an area where you can do prescribed fire, that seems to work pretty well at knocking it back and preventing seed formation, but you're still going to have to follow up with some kind of uh, control after that. Autumn olive is uh, similar to bush honeysuckle, except for it's a little less shade tolerant. You're going to find it at the edge of the forest, open forest or in open lands more so. Uh, produces a ton of seed, spreads quickly, a major issue in open land management or tree plantings in those areas. That kind of gray green color and the little dots that are on the leaves and on the fruit really jump out and make you easy to recognize this. And again, it can grow in the forest, particularly open forest. This one uh, is opposite in terms of what controls it compared to honeysuckle, where we've had actually mixed results with glyphosate, so it doesn't do as well as we want, but um, either 2,4-D mixed with triclopyr or triclopyr straight, um, both those seems to work really well. I like basal bark applications. Um, you can do cut stump as well or foliar on small ones. They seem to all work. It's not a hard plant to control. It's just we've had not good luck using glyphosate on this one. Uh, Multiflora rose. Um, this one is used to be really, really a big problem, and it's kind of becoming less so now. There is a, a, a virus, a rose rosette disease, which is a viral disease that does seem to knock this back at some level of a cyclical nature. Um, my main thing about identifying multiflora rose is to make sure that it's the exotic multiflora rose that you're dealing with, and not one of our native roses. We have a handful of native roses. In general, the bigger ones are going to have smaller leaflet numbers. So this has uh, multiflora rose has seven to eleven leaflets. Most of our natives will have five or less. And then multiflora rose, if you look at the base of the leaf where it attaches to the stem, it's going to have a little um, stipule, almost like a bract, and it's going to be feathery or, or fleshy, like you can see in that top right picture right there, where the native ones will have just a solid piece of, of tissue right there. And then the multiflora rose has tiny little rose hips, clusters of multiple flowers as well. So once you get used to them, you can tell them apart. But I've seen a lot of our native rose killed um, by people thinking it was multiflora rose. But this is both a forest and an open land setting, but it loves that inner that interface, that wooey, the area where you've got that edge habitat or old fields. That's where it does it best. Uh, in terms of controlling it, uh, foliar applications on the smaller ones with glyphosate, triclopyr, 2,4-D, a number of herbicides work really well. Personally, I use that triclopyr, 2,4-D combination, so something like crossbow uh, seems to work really well for me. Uh, that's kind of my go-to. Cut stump works really well. Um, prescribed fire uh, does a good job of knocking it back, but again, you're going to have to follow it up. Um, Oreo and bittersweet, that one is a tree killer. So this is the one that can grow up into trees, wrap them around, girdle them, um, just make them so heavy that they'll die in windstorms, um, break branches. There's a lot of damage. This is the, one of the most damaging invasives directly to trees that we have. Um, when you're figuring it out and want to identify it, again, care should be taken because we do have a native called American bittersweet that you want to keep. It doesn't really do that same kind of damage. You only see it one vine at a time here and there. If you want to identify those, the female plants, so the berry producing plants of oriental bittersweet, like you see in this picture, is going to have lots and lots of fruit that occur all up and down the vine. And then it's bright red fruit with a kind of yellowishy orange fruit covering, as you can see. Uh, the American bittersweet, their fruit are only at the end of the vines, so it's called terminal fruit, so only at the end, and their fruit covering, they're going to have fewer seeds or fewer fruit, and their fruit coverings are really, really dark, almost red-orange. 
So once you get the once you kind of get the hang of that, they're pretty easy to tell apart. But in general, I've never seen American bittersweet form big infestations and really uh, just overwhelm trees like I have seen with um, Oriental bittersweet. Big woody vine, I've seen it get up to. Um, I think the biggest one I've seen is five, almost six inches in diameter for a vine. They tend to climb way at 60 feet up in a tree. The other name for them is round leaf bittersweet because their leaves are really, really perfectly round. Our native one is more egg shaped. In terms of controlling this one, it can be a really a big challenge. It is a clonal species, which means that it's underground root network will send up multiple stems, sometimes far away from each other. And so that big connected underground root system will respond vigorously if it's da if anything above ground is damaged. So if you cut a stem off and don't kill that plant, you'll come back and you'll have a hundred suckers that next year all around you. Uh, because of that, I typically stay away from cut stump and mowing it, um, generally because you're gonna have bigger problems that next year. Um, the other thing that can happen is that vine can run along the ground. It may root three or four times on the ground um, before it finally climbs into a tree. So you have to make sure that you actually are cutting it at the, the end point where it's, where it's actually rooting the final time. Um, I like, fo you can foliar spray, dense pa patches of sprouts on the ground, but basil barking with triclopyr, those larger vines, seems to be uh, the way to go. And then Tree of Heaven is kind of similar in the sense that it's a clonal species as well. This one, uh, people get mixed up a lot for sumac if it's small or even for walnut if it's large. The big thing to uh, key in on on it is it has a lot of leaflets per leaf. Each leaflet's gonna have that little notch uh, and with a gland on it at the base like that. And then um, just like you can see on this bottom right picture. And then each, uh, you can crush a leaf up and it's going to smell really bad, kind of like uh, rancid peanut butter or cat urine is what people say. The female plants will have these winged seeds with the seed in the middle and wings on either side of it. Uh, it is clonal, like I said, so you have these big connected patches. That makes controlling it very difficult. Um, the clonal species will sprout aggressively if damaged. Because of that, I stay away from cut stump treatments. I tend to do basil bark on the smaller stems or injection, hack and squirt they call it, where you you cut a ring around it and then you treat those there. Um, that seems to work pretty well um, and it doesn't stimulate it to root sucker as aggressively. So I do like the inject hack, hack and squirt or girdling it and treating the, the, girdle, the, the girdle better um, for the bigger vine, for the bigger stems and then basil bark for the smaller ones. It seems to work well. Uh, a mazapir, which we didn't talk about, or picloram work pretty well. You have to be careful with both of those because they move in the soil, so you don't want to be around desirable trees, or triclopyr works okay on that. Uh, and then the last one I want to talk about is collery pear. We mentioned it already. Bradford pear, a lot of people know of it. This is the one that everybody knows as an ornamental. When it escapes, it looks a little different. It's more of a shrub. It gets thorns. The leaves get smaller. Um, so it kind of gets mistaken for plums sometime, but uh, wide, widespread across the state, escaping all across the state. Uh, and in the spring, it's easy to identify because it's the first uh, tree that you see roadside that's flowering white in the spring. Um, it's probably going to be the collery pear. The good news about it is it seems to be fairly easy to control. Uh, cut stump treatments work pretty well with pretty much any herbicide we've tried. Foliar spray works pretty well for smaller stems. And then kind of after mowing it, you can let those, if you want to have little ones, let them sprout back and then spray them with a foliar spray. It all seems to work pretty well. And then since collery pear is an ornamental plant and still used, I wanted to mention here before we do the next knowledge check-in and then wrap up at the end, I know I'm over time, but there's several other woody invasives that, that are commonly used in horticulture that are um, being invasive across the state. So just again, do your research, know what you're planting and not, and don't intentionally spread some of these known invaders. All right, so all I've got left is my summary, but this is time for our second check-in. And so I left you with a picture of a big grumpy toad. So April, if you can put in the questions. All right, first question, this should be easy. 
Which of these invasive plants is a biennial forb that has allelopathic properties? We didn't talk about allelopathy, but we did talk about which one is biennial. Alrighty, we have a few seconds left, but I'll just go ahead. It seems like most people have voted. Um, so gar most people are right. Garlic mustards are biennial. Bush, bush honeysuckle and multiflorose are woody plants and reed canary grass is a perennial grass. So very good. Uh, last one here, what type of treatment involves applying a concentrated uh, solution herbicide directly to the low stem of a woody plant. Alrighty. So it looks like every, most people got it right. That would be a basal bark application. You're doing directly to the bark. Uh, injection would involve uh, somehow damaging that, that bark and putting it inside the bark. And then cut stomp, of course, is cutting that plant down all the way and then treating the cut surface. Good deal. Alrighty, so I've got a couple summary slides and then uh, I know we're over time, but we can take some questions if people have it. So kind of in summary, invasive species come in all taxa. Invasive plants in particular are a serious threat to natural system and native uh, species. We see loss of diversity, loss of productivity, reduction in wildlife, alterations of our ecosystems, and really invasive species are pervasive and across all regions of Illinois. Uh, arborists do have an important role to play in combating these invasive species, and that's through education, early detection, control, prevention, and uh, promoting and using non-invasive alternatives. That's a major important role for arborists. And then being able to recognize these common invaders, making positive identification of them is a good first step to management. There's a lot of multiple control techniques out there that you can use, understanding which ones to use when, what is most uh, effective, and then especially understanding the legal requirements and the licenses you need to be able to do that in Illinois is important um, for you to be effective and safe and legal. So with that, um, I'll leave my number and my uh, email address up there and another picture of some of my kids. Um, so people can write that down. If you need have specific questions later, you're welcome to email me.